Yes, ma'am. It is April 2nd, 2021, and you are listening to episode 32 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. I hope everyone enjoyed the last episode with Chris Pell of the Cincinnati Symphony. I really appreciated Chris's honesty in our discussion, and I hope that everyone was able to learn something from that episode. If you missed out on it, you can find links to it on our website, CandidClarinetistPodcast.com. I'm so happy to be joined today by two of my very dear friends. Ryan T. Nelson is a lecturer in the music theater department at Northwestern University and the music director at the Wirtz Center for the Performing Arts at Northwestern University, as well as the resident music director at Chicago's Marriott Theater, which is one of the great regional theaters in the country. Nice to see you today, Ryan. Great to see you, Sam. Ian Weinberger is currently the music director for Hamilton on Broadway and has conducted numerous Broadway shows, tours, and has worked on musicals and various productions around the country. Ian, how are you, man? Hello, sir. It's lovely to see your face. Yeah, it's absolutely great to have both of you here. Um, Ian and Ryan, I knew I knew from my time at Northwestern. Ian and I actually go back to high school. We played in a musical together in high school, Ragtime. Um, right. And yeah, so we, were in, we played together in high school, and then we went to the same school together, and uh, we worked on a lot of shows together there, actually. Um, Ian sort of got into the musical theater thing, even though I believe you entered uh, with better intentions. Um, much, much better intentions. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't uh, we all, though, really? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, Ian was a uh, music education major, if I if I remember, and uh, he he would music direct a lot of these shows over the summer, and and I would I would play uh, in the in the orchestra for those. So that's sort of, that was sort of my intro into the whole musical theater industry, but I wanted to bring these guys on because obviously they're very successful in this industry. And I think now it's more important than ever that musicians are very well-rounded and, um, you know, not everyone is going to get a job in an orchestra. And my first job was uh, touring with uh, the uh, production of Les Miserables, and it was a terrific experience. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, and it's absolutely a, a viable option for for performers. Um, so I wanted to bring them on and just talk about their experiences. Obviously, um, they're, they're, they both have very different paths, but very successful in, in their own right. So I just wanted to start out and, and just ask you guys sort of what first got you interested in musical theater? Uh, since you're in this order on my screen, I'll, we'll start with Ian. I um I was always sort of interested in musical theater, I think, as as a young person. I, our family, I always say, was a cast album family, you know, <laughs> it, like it, in the car and stuff, right? And um, my parents are not artistic at all, but they're big fans. They they both grew up on on theater and, and seeing theater with their parents. And so my sister and I very much grew up, you know, with listening to cast albums like in the car. The first show I ever saw was at the Marriott, actually um which I which i think know. i was i think i was like two and a half years old or something like that and i saw some production of the red shoes uh with music direction by kevin stites oh yeah uh, oh, no way that's and, fine yeah, yeah yeah and um so uh i so i as long as i can remember i was growing up on on theater and uh and seeing theater and there was a time in my young young life when i thought i was gonna act when I, you know, acted a little in community theater and a little bit at school, and I loved being a part of the community. I loved being a part of that ecosystem of the, I loved that theater's a team sport. I loved that there's such a collaborative nature to it, and there's such a, like, delicious, hectic frenzy to put a show up. I love, you know, even at, like, eight years old in community theater, I could sort of sense that. That was really fun for me, but I really hated being on stage. And I didn't really clock that until I realized I could do something else in the theater ecosystem. And I was like, oh, I like this better. Um, but I was always, always into it as a kid. Very cool. Ryan, how about you? 
Wow, my path is strange and uh, <laughs> and also kind of a, like a metaphor for what I'm teaching now. You know, you know. First of all, it's so great to be here with two of like my favorite students of all time. <laughs> Definitely, they broke the mold when you guys left, and uh, <laughs> uh, some things have never quite been the same. Uh, for me, you know, I have always been a little bit like the lost musician, right? So like always a little bit of a fish out of water in all ways musically. You know, I started out as a music education major and really had my, all my sights set on just being a high school band director, which I did uh, and loved it. And then suddenly it was like, oh, maybe I should like also get better at some aspect of music, like have some time to really develop it musically. Uh, so I went to grad school for conducting and and so I did that and I loved that. And I did that like kind of band in the band centric world when conducting went to North Texas. It was a tremendous experience in my life. And, you know, I finished that and I was like, well, maybe I should just do that again and get another degree. <laughs> it's <was just laughs> kind of like, let's try that. You know, and, and it really kind of beautifully landed me uh, at Northwestern where I absolutely started there not in music theater. Uh, and I was part of the conducting faculty uh, for eight years in the School of Music and loved that, you know, but it was really during that time where I realized that I was yearning to, to live in this world that Ian was describing that is like kind of the group sport of music making, like collaborative and like you don't, you're not always the one that has the answer and constantly learning and I was, and I was feeling more that I had other creative sides of me that I wanted to develop. Um, and some of that came out of like my piano background, which I felt had never really fulfilled itself. I didn't feel like a pianist yet. Uh, and then like, in just in terms of like creating music, writing music, arranging music, orchestrating music. And this all started to kind of percolate while I was in the conducting program, uh, in the Bean and School of Music. This all goes back to the fact that I did a ton of music theater in high school and right after high school, there was a really great community theater where I grew up called Center Theater Players got so much opportunity on stage, behind the scenes, conducting the orchestra, all, all the things, you know? But then I put that stuff aside and, uh, and then just ended up in this, you know, academic career as a associate director of bands, uh, which is very much like was another kind of life degree in terms of just becoming a better musician. Because as you, as you guys both know, we both, we kind of all went to the same, you know, my postgraduate training was your undergraduate training. Uh, and then I had a really amazing opportunity to shift to the theater program at Northwestern when they re-envisioned how it would work and that they needed a, a, a musical infrastructure on the school of communication side. So yeah, this is like my 20th year at Northwestern, which is wild. Wow, that's crazy. But uh, <clears throat> I got luckily plugged into the music theater scene in Chicago from a, a number of people at Northwestern and that became my mentors and that which led me to the Marriott and you know it was a lot of like kind of on the job indoctrination and training over many many years and now I find I think I found my place you know and now I get to teach those lost souls like myself <laughs> in this area <laughs> well one thing that you said that struck me was that that you you didn't have all the answers and I maybe you're alone because I always have all the answers and as my dad says <laughs> Often wrong, never in doubt. So um, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, I can hear your dad saying that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. It's great. Um, well, that's so cool that you guys sort of had this. It uh, seems like Ian was sort of more. You had your sights sort of set on that from the beginning. Like you were always kind of into that. Um, whereas Ryan kind of took a more twisty path. Would you Would you agree with that assessment? I almost would. I I I knew that I I always knew that I really loved it. I, knew, I always knew that I was really that it was really interesting for me and that that was in many ways that theater was in many ways like my chosen genre of listening even right like in 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 many ways but I don't think I had my sights set on it set on it in any sort of serious or dare I say professional way until really the end of college um, much much like Ryan I was I was headed toward high school band director yeah. and uh, and that was that was very much the path I thought I was taking, even though I was well aware of and well aware of my own enjoyment of theater. And would you say, Ian, that that, that was because you weren't sure sort of where you fit into that whole thing? Like, I, I guess my question is, since Ryan's here, like, what was the relationship between you? Like, what did Ryan kind of push you and was like, 
because I know that like when when Ryan and I <laughs> talked about you, I, you guys are laughing. Threw but, me under the bus. Yeah, is, yeah. is the phrase yeah. I would <laughs> <the phrase laughs> use. Oh, we gotta no. get it. It's the candid clarinetist, baby. Oh, this is what we're talking <laughs> we about. Getting <laughs> candid. Yeah, so, but but seriously, because I know that like like when Ryan and I, I mean, of course, like Ryan was my band director for like you were the director you know associate director of band so you know i played on you but we developed this friendship and i remember like right at sort of my junior year Ian, this is when you were really getting into it and like really diving pretty deep into this music director thing and um when ryan and i would talk about it i was like ian's like the best music director i've ever worked with you know and ryan was like yeah his skill like there's no skill set comparatively so i'm i'm wondering like how did did was this relationship sort of what pushed you in that direction or a big part of it at least? It absolutely was. And I wonder how much and how quickly I can make him blush when I say, um, I, <laughs> it absolutely was, but I, you know, to, an to answer the first part of your question, I think certainly it, it, it the initial reason that I was heading more toward high school band was a, that I wasn't super aware of music directing as a lifestyle or as a career, or as even, uh, an existing thing, but also I really loved teaching. I really loved the idea of high school band and I was really excited about that path. I loved, I'm, you know, I was a huge wind ensemble nerd for a long time. And like, I was, I was fully, fully dedicated toward that. And the more I sort of experimented in college with, with being a music director and what that sort of meant, um, first by sort of being the assistant to other student music directors, the the people who were like a year ahead of me, and then sort of watching Ryan work as well, the more I started to say to myself, well, that that looks like fun. I could make, I could do that. I could maybe do that. And the more I tried it, the more I discovered that it felt really, really natural for me. It felt like I had sort of instincts about what to try and inevitably fail at. And the the more it felt like I sort of really belonged there. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly at that time, anyway, it wasn't anything that was really taught and certainly not to me or really to anybody until, except for like watching people do it. And this is where Ryan comes into the picture in a big way is that, um, you know, he, he was really in the, the first person to say that I was kind of good at this or that I wasn't, totally going belly up in the middle of the street anyway that uh you know he <laughs> he he was he was enormous in encouraging me to continue and, and you know me and my neurotic self i would always uh come to you with some version of tell me why this is so bad tell me why this is so bad and you would say some version of it's going great what are you worried about um <laughs> which is a a whole other conversation. Yeah. But I think, yeah, we, we don't need to go into the times you've cried on my office couch, but we can. Go into <laughs> but we can. Um, but I think. Uh, but just to say, yes, ab ab absolutely. There was. It was enormously important for me to have a not only a role model, but a, but a mentor of sorts to be like, yes, you're good at that. Continue. Well, you know what's interesting <laughs> is that, and and this is part of my this is my criticism of music schools, and I've been through several of them, and taught in one. Uh, that they, you know, because of the, I, the way you have a major and because of just the type of faculty lines that are offered gener or, or, or hired generally, there are these compartments that as a, you know, a young, <clears throat> I'm going to be a music major, you're like, oh, I guess I got to be music ed or I guess I got to be performance, you know, and there are some other ones, but you get into these like kind of columns that honestly, a lot, a lot of interesting musicians that have a lot to offer don't fit neatly into those columns right and music direction is cool because it fits into a lot of columns you know it's about as it's about as broad as any area of music gets now that is difficult to teach uh because breadth isn't necessarily something that higher education specializes itself in doing for good reason actually um but it is really what we do so like when you have someone that has you know uh, comfortability and interest in the vocal side of things, comfortability and interest in the instrumental, probably has some piano skills uh, and some cr other creatives you, that can really be developed and nurtured. And the way, you know, Northwestern is right now compared to when it was when you guys were there, like it, it's unrecognizable, but only because, you know, we have now built a, a system where I can facilitate more people than just Ian. But, you know, at the time that Ian, 
Ian, you were going through this, you know, like when you and I were in the same stage of development, I was also just discovering this world and just being kind of brazen enough to like, just bring it to Northwestern. <laughs> you know, it was just like, you know, I already knew, I knew early on that while I was very fortunate to have a very coveted job in the band department, it was not what was going to sustain me for my life. It just, I just didn't have that passion for that repertoire. And I'm not being discounting of it because I think there's very much, there's much importance to it. But I knew it like in, day, in year two, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's like then, and then right then I've quickly found other, another uh, possible path that I just pursued relentlessly. You know, but I didn't really even know what being a music director was when, you know, Ian and I were like, Neither did I, yeah. yeah, we were really just kind of both experiencing it at the same time. Like we're both completely different people now and professionally. Right. Well, Ryan, that is just a perfect segue because my next topic on here is <laughs> what is the role of a music director in a show or a musical? So I assure you, if either one of us <laughs> ever finds out, we'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. This question is hilariously difficult because and it is a question that I make my students uh, uh, answer or try to answer. It's kind of unanswerable uh, because it is everything that anything needs in terms of the music for a production. And that can be a thousand different things. How much of it is what? like just putting out fires? Like, is it like 90% fire putting out or does it just depend on the circumstance? I don't know, Ian might deal with more fires than me. <laughs> you probably deal with a lot of fires, <laughs> Ian. <laughs> uh, I think certainly some of it. I think mm -hmm. what you said, Ryan, is absolutely true. It, it is a very hard question to answer. And I think the reason for that is that um, it depends so intensely on the project and the people you're working on the project with. Because something about the music director role I have found, you can define it very easily in a blanket one sentence, which is that you're responsible for everything that happens musically in a production, right? Usually that means uh, being responsible for teaching the vocals to the cast and sort of working with the cast, but not always. Usually that means conducting the orchestra, but not always. Um, mm -hmm. Usually it, you know, all of the, so, so even then you start to get into um, hypotheticals in some ways or, or ways in which it differs. But I think you, the music director, end up adapting in so many ways what um, elements of the job you do based on the people you're working with. And that could be the director, the choreographer, the composer, the uh, producers, the orchestrators, the, the, the actors, God knows, like any of those things can change what your actual relationship to the project is, which is kind of what makes it fun because you don't ever really go into something doing the same thing you did last time. Totally. Yep. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, you guys can both answer this question, but like, Ian, you've worked on Hamilton for God, how many years now? A lot, a lot it, of years. Uh, Cause I, I remember, <laughs> I'll tell this story. I remember I went to New York. I think I was taking a lesson with, with one of the New York Phil guys and we were sitting there with, um, it was me and you and Sam Rogers, uh, who's a friend of ours. He's, he, he's a former, um, Broadway dancer. He, he danced in a number of shows. Um, and, and you, you said to me, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm working on this, you know, new musical. It's a, it's a hip hop musical about Alexander Hamilton. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> You're like, I think it's going to be pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, okay. And then sure okay. enough, they're like, yeah. <laughs> that's um, so funny. I had the same reaction when uh, Ian told me, and he was also like, I think it's going to be kind of important. And I was like, <laughs> Okay, sure. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever you think. Yeah. Yeah, probably the most influential musical since Rent, probably. Yes, since we... Rent, probably. Yeah. And uh and before that chorus line, I would argue. I yeah. um yep. I think um yeah, I've been with it six years now. Um when you when you take uh when you include the year we've just had. Uh so five years of you know actual work. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I came on board with it, um, about two weeks after it opened at the public theater off Broadway. Um, so this is, uh, we, it, the show opened in February. I joined in March and then the show opened on Broadway in August. Cool. Yes. August. And, um, 
and uh, that's that that was a whole surprising journey to all of us. And and I, I remember those kinds of early days. It's funny that you both remember a version of that because <laughs> it it feels it in my memory it was like being thrown into um, a spinning la laundry machine uh, of like I I don't really know what this is and it's moving too fast for me to see it. But uh, but I think it's cool. Uh, <laughs> but it, that all feels like a very long time ago. But yes, yeah. I put out some fires at that yeah. job. Well, and I was going to ask too, because like Ryan, you've built a number of new shows as well at the Marriott and at Northwestern, and and like, what does the music directorship change when you're you've been working on a show for five years and you know your cast is turning over versus you know new project, no orchestrations, you know. Clean yeah. slate. I, I'm assuming that it's much different. It's it's a much different thing. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think there are there are, again different modes of working. Definitely different animals. You know, I don't really do what Ian does. Is like stick with the show for a long period of time. You know, even when a Marriott show opens, I, I get it open, and then you know, unless I like sub conduct, which I will do on occasion, depending on schedule and whatever. The show is um i you know sometimes i don't even see it again unless i'm like called to go take notes on it because that's just not that's just not in our model uh of what you know and, and and it's kept up quite well for the you know 10 weeks or so that it's funny it's not like it's running for much longer than that um but i am churning them out like a conveyor belt in a factory <laughs> so like there is a you know there is a logistic side of my life when things are normal between northwestern and the marriott and anything else, you know and just like making sure that all of these like plates are spinning for all of these different shows you know everything's in a different phase a show can be in performance another one in rehearsal another one in auditioning another one in pre-production you know all in the same day at the marriott right um, so, so, but that speaks to me and that's, you know, that, that kind of like business acumen side and organization. I know I think Aaron, Ian and I are very similar and that I think that we're kind of good at that part of it. Um, and kind of not, and don't hate it. Right. So like that, that's, that's a huge side. And then the artistic side to me is like just all the bonus, you know, and that's, you know, the learning and growth that also comes out of that is really rewarding. Yeah. I, Go ahead, I, Ian, sorry. I, I would agree with all of that. And and you're right on the money, Sam, that, that it's a very, very different kind of thing. And what I miss in my normal life is that's with air quotes for everyone listening at home <laughs> is that is is what you describe, Ryan, of the like spinning a lot of plates, which which uh, which I try to do in my Hamilton life is keep at least something else on the side to like keep that part of me engaged. But Hamilton is because of the long-term nature of it is, is about maintenance, um, right. which, which is a very different kind of thing. And I, you know, jury's still out about like how good my brain is at doing that particular thing, but it's about, you know, in six years, the notes haven't changed. The words haven't changed. Uh, they have a small amount, but that's a different story. But, but by and large, the play is still the play. And so it's my gig to, um, I'm just now remembering how much Ryan hates it when I say play. Yes, um, the, <laughs> I was thinking uh, the same thing. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it, so it's my gig to make sure that when someone shows up to the theater on a Thursday, that it still sounds the way it's supposed to. Um, and that's done w similarly with like the type A brain of it all, of just like keeping track of a lot of notes and a lot of status reports and trying to like keep the balls in the air as much as possible. And I think, you know, with the show being where it is, it's kind of a self-sustaining machine at this point where it's like you guys have eight shows a week, but you have new cast members all the time, you know, sometimes in major roles. And so it's part of your job, as I understand, to sort of get them all up to speed because the shows don't just stop to install a new cast member. It's, <laughs> you know, so quite the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's sort of a uh, a revolving door of of people and this being a this particular moment being a huge exception because uh, when we all come back to work, eventually we're all going to be sort of relearning it afresh together, which will be um, the first time that happened since the show opened. Otherwise people uh, come in on a very, very random and individualized schedule. And that's because people leave the show on a very random and individualized schedule. And so they have to be replaced on such a schedule. And so, um, 
we do our best to sort of pair people together and say, if we can put in a handful of people to the show at once, but by and large, sometimes it's one or two people per month and then one or two people the next month ad infinitum. So um, it, what that means is as you're, as you're absolutely right, we can't stop the show. So sort of the parallel of what Ryan was talking about earlier is we have to still perform the show eight times a week at night while keeping track of who's coming into the show next week who's a week out, who's two weeks out, who's a month out, who we need to start casting because somebody's leaving in four months um, and sort of keep keep an eye on all of those things times five companies in the United States. Luckily, I only deal with Broadway, but there are people whose job it is to sort of do that math of there are five companies of Hamilton in North America. And if somebody's leaving from here, what do we need to do to replace them over there or something like that? It's a, it's a mess. Yeah. And can I just say that the complexity of all that, you know, the music theater community and a whole doesn't even probably appreciate the kind of that complexity at that level for a show like Hamilton and what is being accomplished there to create a product that no matter who sees it on what night in any city is seeing basically the same show. That's an astounding accomplishment. That is, next to impossible to do yeah I'm it's blushing. crazy good job ian thank you <laughs> good job <Shucks>. yeah. <laughs> um so <clears throat> you guys touched on this a little bit but i just wanted to know like how long did it take you to sort of get your foot in the door and like start working at the professional level like ryan at the at the marriott and ian like i remember ian i i went and stayed with you i think I, again i was taking a lesson or something and i stayed with you in new york and you were like having lunch with people, you were having like coffee with people, you know, like that was like sort of your, you know, you were, I think you were making a copy for somebody, like you were doing some like copy work or something like that. And like, it, you know, it takes a little while. So, I, you know, what's your, what's your story? Uh, Ryan, let's start with you. Yeah. You know, I, I'm very fortunate because I've always kind of like tied the professional work to my teaching job at Northwestern and been able to facilitate those two worlds together, which is, I'm very fortunate about. I don't even know many other places in the country that you, one could really do that. Um, but you know, the, you know, the Marriott took a chance on me back in 2005, uh, um, the artistic producer, then Rick Boynton, who's now at the Chicago Shakespeare theater came to see a show at Northwestern that I conducted parade and then wanted to meet and, you know, offered me footloose, which was my first professional show. Um, and, and you know, and from a couple of years there, they were really just giving me like the rock jukebox musicals <laughs> and because I, I mean I think you know Ian and I has share a, I think our you know I always talk about superpowers with my students like you know you have to know a lot of things in this field a lot and you got to work on all of them all the time but you're going to have that one thing that you're really going to you're going to feel like you're the mo you're the best at and you're you're you know I like uh, listening to your podcast because I am a can declare an artist fan Sam you use the word world class a lot and I like that that kind of terminology like you have to have something in your your music direction arsenal that is like your world-class thing you know and for me it's the teaching for sure um and i think ian you probably feel similar Not no no similar. We're, we're exactly the same in that yeah, way yeah yeah, yeah yeah so i think that i had this like rapport with these like younger casts um you know and, and that too being 15 years ago you know i was i was in like my mid-30s and was able to like connect with them but like if anyone knows me musically, like rock musicals, that's not my expertise. <laughs> like I am like a classically trained dude from beginning to end, you know? Like, give give so, him the like, song time. Yeah. So I was, but see, I, I wasn't getting those. And then yeah. I actually started lobbying for, because I wasn't full time that I was lobbying for them. And I lobbied for Light in the Piazza. Mm -hmm. uh, lobbied hard to do Light in the Piazza. That was more my jam. And uh, I got that. And then from that point on, it was like, oh, wait, why don't you just do all of them? <laughs> and then I pretty much, pretty much started doing all of them. And which is very, again, very fortunate. And I've had some great mentors there. Terry James, who's the current executive producer, um, was the kind of full-time music director before he became producer. And then they had kind of an array of music directors and just learned a lot from him about like, it's, I was serious about how to work with vocalists better because that was definitely one of my weaknesses, right? And just kind of working that professional, there's a lot, a lot of on the job training, you know, uh, that I look back on, I'm like, oh God, I would never have hired myself at that time, knowing what I know now that I didn't know that, right? 
Uh, and I, but that's a game I think we can all play with ourselves all the time. Oh yeah. So that's how I ended up there, you know, and then from there I've gotten so, you know, some other, some other work, but I've been primarily working at the Marriott. Cool. Ian, how about you? I, um, I, I'm laughing because I remember my favorite note that Terry James ever gave in a production meeting that I attended, which was, there was a funny trombone thing somewhere in the show, not to get too specific. <laughs> Harry does not like trombone, bassoon, or bass. Anything bass clef oriented I love it. is definitely a negative for him. <laughs> that, um, that production of The Light in the Piazza was so beautiful. I saw it two times. It was so gorgeous, and your work on it was so beautiful. And dear God, that's a lot of notes. I, uh, you're about to say something. Well, it says the guy who that ended up working for Adam Gettle right out of college, but <laughs> yeah, but I never had to play any of that stuff. My God, um, I uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right, Sam. That when I came to New York, which was shortly out of Northwestern, I sort of had no real idea of how to go about about building a career in theater. I knew what I wanted to do, which was someday conduct on Broadway. Um, but in order to do that, I sort of, is someday. Uh, and I sort of- um, Nailed it. Well, I mean, got very lucky. And um, I, what I sort of, I knew or half knew a couple of Northwestern alumni who were doing that. I knew Brad Hawk and I knew Joe Falcon who had both come through Northwestern at some point while I was there because of you, Ryan, to, to sort of uh, meet us and or, or they were both involved in either campus activities or in Brad's case to check on Mary Poppins in Chicago. And so I sort of halfway knew them both and I took them both to coffee and they were sort of the ones who started introducing me around to people and started um, asking me questions about who am I and what do I want to do and what am I good at? And to use Ryan's phrase, what's my superpower and, and that sort of thing. Um, and the thing that happened to me first actually came through a roommate of mine. I was, I was, uh, I found myself working as the music intern on, uh, the revival of anything goes starring Sutton Foster. And I remember calling Ryan on the phone the day I found out I, I got the, the job and I'm putting job in air quotes. I was working entirely for free. <laughs> and, um, I remember telling you, I remember exactly where I was standing. I remember telling you, Hey, I'm doing this thing. I'm going to be the music intern on this upcoming Broadway show. And I remember exactly what you said to me. You said, this is how it starts. And, <laughs> um, and you are absolutely right. And um, well, okay, not to interrupt, but uh, I don't know that I, you know, when you went to New York, I didn't understand exactly that rite of passage, the how, you know, the, the steps, right? And, what, and as you explain your story, I'd love for people to understand that Ian really has trailblazed the way that all Northwestern students now think about how to engage in a, the professional um the professional world in new york right and it's been insanely successful for many 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 of them right just and they've all they're all following your footsteps and but, but you know they often all want to meet with you you're like a, cele a celebrity to them <laughs> um, and inevitably they're very disappointed when they do but continue <laughs> but, but that this journey you're about to describe you have you they you have you know shown the path to so many, which has been really life-changing to our whole program. But sorry, continue. That's uh, very <laughs> kind of you. I'm grateful no one can see how much I'm blushing. I, um, it's, you know- oh, it'll, it, be, it'll be on YouTube, don't worry. Yes. Yeah, perfect, perfect. What's, um, what's, cause what's weird about all of this, right? Is that there is no hard and fast way to find your way into music direction or really being a theater musician professionally, right? Unlike our actor friends who, have a sort of a, the concrete thing of you get a job by going to an audition and you book the job at the audition. We don't really have that. Um, and it's not just us. The same is true for choreographers, for directors, for stage managers, for basically everybody else. Um, and so uh, this this proverbial rite of passage that, that, uh, that Ryan mentions is that if you want to be a music director in New York, you often find yourself doing this music intern job, commonly now known as music assistant as well, which is exactly what it sounds like, I often say. You, you're responsible for sort of sitting in the corner of the rehearsal room, trying not to bother anybody, and it's basically your gig to keep the score, the physical score, up to date. And that usually means finale or Sibelius files that change every day as the show develops. and. Um, you're responsible for making those cuts or making those edits to the music or transposing this thing or putting in the new dance section or whatever it may be, changing the dialogue. 
and then updating, making sure everybody has the right music, right? And that was so beneficial to me because, and the reason it's sort of the way in for most young music directors is that you're um, working for, working with the entire music staff of that particular production. So you get a front row seat to just sort of like watching the thing get made. And you learn so much about why decisions get made the way they do. You get to watch them teach. You get to watch the like production meeting where everybody's like, I don't know how to fix the opening number. Do you know how to fix the opening number? I don't know how to fix the opening number, whatever. Like, what if we try it up a step? All that stuff. Like you just learn so much about how the thing happens because I think for most people who don't see it from the inside, right? Like you go to see guys and dolls and you figure guys and dolls just always existed. And that's just sort of what it is. And of course it's not like that at all. So you learn, you just learn a lot. And without boring the pants off of you and your listeners, the sort of trajectory from there was doing a lot of music assistant work for a lot of different shows. One of which allowed me to start subbing as a keyboard player um, after the show had opened. And that, um, was useful to them because I knew the show so well and useful to me because I really wanted and needed that experience. And subbing as a keyboard player led me to subbing on more shows, which led me to subbing as a conductor on certain shows, which eventually led me around to Hamilton, where I started as a, as a sub. Um, and but, but it's the sort of music assistant thing that is sort of the, uh, the way in for most people who want to be music directors for that reason, so that they can see it and sort of learn sort of how the thing happens from the inside. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, thanks for sharing those, those stories. I know it's, it's not always easy to start out. Um, and I, I guess I'll tell my story since it's my podcast and I can do what I want. Um, <laughs> but basically, so how I got this job with, with Les Mis is, is, was actually, I, I played summer musicals. Essentially that's how I like made money over the summer was, Ian or Ryan or whomever was conducting a summer musical at Northwestern would call me and say, Hey, there's a read book. Do you want to play it for it? And I played a little bit of saxophones. Sure. So I, I would make some money over the summer. And there was a show I did after my junior year. I can't even remember the name of the show. Um, not wanted on the voyage. Not wanted on the voyage. That's right. No, it was a, so beautiful. I'm yeah, just going to cool. interject to talk about how beautiful this show was and no one ever saw it again. And it's a tragedy. Because <laughs> it was I loved epic. It. it was epic. Yeah. yeah um, was. So it was a brand new musical and they built it all from scratch. At There's this thing called the American Musical Theater Project. And Ryan's heavily involved with that. I'm not, is it still happening? Is that still around? It is still happening. Uh, you know, what was great about those early days when you were involved and Ian and, and, and for me too, that it was, it was much more geared toward production and bringing in a lot of amazing directors and composers. And there's still a lot of great collaboration that led to your story, uh, yeah. but now it's shifted to more of kind of like workshop and uh, composer development. It's yeah, still yeah. It, it is powerful. Just the model has changed a little bit. Cool. Um, yeah. So, so anyways, so they, they didn't have any orchestrations. And so they, they hired this guy. Um, his name is Chris Yonke. He's crazy guy like absolutely like off the wall you can't even imagine i, I love the guy he's great he's great super friendly so anyways he came here and like all he wanted to do was like write these orchestrations and then like hang out with everybody like that's all he wanted to do because he was there for three months and he didn't know anybody so he was like yeah hey, we'll go to the bar you know whatever um and Where you he know often he, wrote his orchestrations as well uh, yeah, that's right. right he would sit he would sit at the bar at davis street fish market which isn't there anymore no. and he would have like the beer in his left hand and the pencil in his right no piano no recording of the music oh. nothing he would just sit there and like at with the ambient noise of the bar <laughs> around him he would write yeah. And, um, and so anyways, so he would just, uh, and so he got to know the people in the orchestra and, uh, we would hang out and stuff and, and, you know, he'd done some pretty big work. He worked with, uh, Bill Brown who orchestrated Wicked and, you know, lots of, lots of famous, um, musicals in his past. And then he Chris, orchestrated Legally Blonde on Broadway. Yeah. Uh, Chris did Legally Blonde mm -hmm. and he, and he had done some of the new orchestrations for the new version of Les Mis. So fast forward to... A month later, um, he leaves, yeah. and then I get a phone call, and it's from uh, Michael Keller, who's a contractor in New York. And Chris had given my name to Michael Keller as like, "Hey, this guy's really good. He's a really great clarinet player. You should call him," because they were looking for people for this national tour. So I got a call. Our violist got a call. Who um, now? I guess the show closed, but he was the he's he was the uh, the music director of Miss Saigon, the national tour of Miss Saigon. Will so Curry. Will yeah. Curry. Um, and he played viola. So Will and I went on this tour. And so 
Um, I just wanted to to do a little uh, PSA. You are not too good to play in musicals. You are not. You you will learn a lot of things if you do so, and you will also make money doing it. One of the very few things that will pay you to do to, to play your <laughs> instrument the best over the PSA summer. I've yes. ever heard. So and, and you know who else was in that? Not one of them, the Voyage Orchestra. Evan Epifanio, who is the principal bassoonist of the Met yes. Opera Orchestra. So if the yes. acting principal clarinet of the Indianapolis Symphony yes. and the principal bassoonist of the Met Orchestra can play in a summer musical, you can too. And I highly recommend it. You never know where it will lead. It's very, very important for connections and just learning different skills. So off my soapbox. I love that <laughs> PSA. It's, yeah, and it's, you know, it's a different kind of playing too, right? Like, yeah. You know, it's I. I always sell it when I start recruiting players at Northwestern for these orchestras. I, I, you know, I, my, I have the kind of like opening first rehearsal kind of monologue I give, and it's like, look, this is like this is chamber music, right? The way that you're going to have to communicate and make decisions and solve problems. We don't really we don't rehearse in the normal model. We don't have time to stop and talk about every bar and you know all the minutiae, which is important, uh, particularly in academic ensembles to like understand the importance of detail and how to get at musicality through detail. But theater does not allow that time. So you have to bring that in this kind of chamber music rehearsal. And, and most of the time you're playing without a conductor, you know, or a keyboard conductor who is like only conducting when absolutely required. So it's it's a and then just you know navigating a show. You know how that yeah, that part actually is your guide to get through two and a half hours of music where you're you're having to react to the stage it's a whole different way of operating right yeah and and i think too also um i always took it upon a, ch a challenge upon myself to see like how tight we could get it as the show went along and like okay can i do better tonight than i did the previous night and so and right. inevitably you you'd have nights where you failed at that because it just mm -hmm. it's the nature of the business i mean We've all done that, but uh, I, I, you know, that's what I do now because we do this Christmas show in, in, in Indianapolis called the Yuletide Celebration, and we do 31 shows of it, and I take it as a challenge, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to see if I can be better tonight than I was the previous night, and just learning that kind of mindset, um, I, it's really helped me, so um, yeah. I imagine that it would help help anybody. Um, so cool. Um, Ryan, uh, you, you talked about how there sort of has not been a vehicle for teaching this music directorship uh, and you sort of created this new program. You built it out of uh, your own creativity, basically. Um, what kind of like classes do you teach? I, I took one class from you when I was when I was there. I took an orchestration class, but like, what what kind of other things do you teach that sort of would help people along this track? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I'll kind of talk about the evolution of this because it was I don't it wasn't like a plan. <laughs> But, um, and there are very, I mean, I only know of, and I could be wrong about this, about like three, maybe four uh, positions in institutions of higher education that have someone doing kind of what I do. And most of those are master's level. Um, and so Northwestern is interesting because it's evol it evolved in, in a number of ways. One is that we have this show called the WAMU show. Uh, which is basically a, a, a very large scale student written musical, student written performed orchestrated musical that has been around since 1929. Ian's going to yell at me. He's like the aficionado on these details. Am I I'm not going to yell at you. I'm just going to tell you it was 1927, but I love 27. You. There we go. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, now I'm nervous because Ian is like the WAMU, like super, Hardly. super soldier. Um, <laughs> But it was, you know, it's existed forever, right? And it has always been a vehicle for creation. And a lot of that, in terms of music direction, for, for many years, that kind of happened from just outside music directors that came to do it. I was lucky to start to get affiliated with it right when I got to Northwestern. And, you know, it was really through there where I, I started to get this love of creating things um, and then learning to actually do the job well. And it came, it came to a point when I switched over to the School of Communication and we were like, separating ourselves from the School of Music somewhat, um, the real thing that started this program was orchestration, was that there was a need to orchestrate the WAMU show. And, we, and, and, and I was asked the question, do you think this is something that's teachable? And I was like, sure, 
because <laughs> I basically believe all things are teachable, right? They should be because people can do them. They learn them. But, you know, I was like, you know, not really thinking deeply about how I was going to execute that and make sure that happened. But it, but, uh, it, it took a little time, but it did. So that you know, theater orchestration became like a study area at school. Um, and uh, was really is really a fascinating area to study when you're an undergraduate and just bringing the history of music theater orchestration and just the, the approach approaches to just making things that sound good but then are also like supporting the stage it's just a really fascinating area so that that got started and then as as when ian was there there would be productions happening at northwestern that you know i if i was doing i would always involve other students and basically assisting helping right uh, and we should talk about the great 2009 Leonard Bernstein's mask that we all three did mm -hmm. uh, oh, we in, should. In, in a moment. But uh, we as as we as I evolved into my new position, I started doubling down on this and really involving more students. And it really honestly was just kind of an, a moment uh, where we were doing a production of Spring Awakening and I had a great student. His name uh, was uh, Nick, um, Nick Day, a great musician who's now like in politics but he i was like do you want to sub and conduct one of the shows and he was just like yeah and like we prepped him for it and then he just did it and i was like well we should just be doing this this is the way to do this so really from that point on i basically now have this system and it's very much parallels what ian described as like how you get a job in new york our system of what we call team music northwestern is that for every production we are basically doing this kind of apprenticeship ladder uh, climbing system that you start out just like on the team as like an assistant doing various things that other students, the older ones are very good about like, like instructing you. There's so much peer to peer instruction that I can never do in classes. It's just too much that happens in the process and how you interact in a rehearsal process and they build themselves up and then they get their own shows that they music direct and I supervise as seniors. And that model has really now kind of like, it, it's strong enough that like the, the internal teaching that I'm not even involved in has yielded inc incredible results for the older students. Um, but I do teach a couple of classes that kind of serve this process. So the theater orchestration class that has evolved into a second level now. So an advanced version of that, where we deal uh, more with tech, more with arranging actually, which is, it seems like cart before the, like in the backwards process, but it works pretty well that you deal with more arranging after you get the mechanics of orchestration down and technology. Uh, and then I teach a music direction seminar, which is just kind of an overview of the business and what we do. It's more of like an onboarding kind of class. And, and we get into some philosophical topics and when we talk about like unions and just things that never come up in school and entrepreneurship, which is the other thing. This is my other big thing about schools of music or just universities in general. It's like jobs aren't waiting for you. You have to know how to leave school and create your own work. And I think music schools don't generally do a very good job of addressing that, right? So we are addressing that first, like right in the entryway to music direction, like no one's gonna hire you <laughs> unless you look for a way to be hired or you create something, right? So those three classes uh, are the, the main classes. I feel like I'm leaving one out. Oh uh, yeah, and then the other classes I teach serve the music theater program. So it's really a lot, it's a lot of apprenticeship. It's a lot of like learn on the job. I, I, I'm, I am present at these rehearsals and I mentor, you know, and I push and I challenge, you know, and, and, and the process, you know, is really like kind of another four year degree. It's very informal. It's just a theater degree or a music degree, depending what their major is, but. Yeah. And I, I, I'll, I only want to just highlight something Ryan said, which is that that apprenticeship, not only does it sort of mirror a little way of, in a little bit, wow, I can't talk. Not only does it sort of mirror in some, in many ways, what happens out in, in sort of the real world, but it's also, I have often said, kind of the only way to learn so much of this stuff. Yes. You know, so, as you said earlier, Ryan, like music directing, you can really only sort of learn by trial and error in the room by doing things or by watching others doing it, which is why, the model you have set up or by being a music assistant or the associate music director on some show is so valuable is because you get to really get your sea legs in the room. It's very, very hard to teach 
you know, the rehearsal skills or the sort of working with the actor or uh, figuring out how to make the cuts to serve the dialogue and all that stuff that you don't really know until you just sort of find your way through doing it. And I had that opportunity to do it before this whole structure existed by this by the same way, by being the assistant music director to other students and to you uh, who were doing what I someday wanted to do. But it's it's impossible to like classroom teach it. And so that's why I'm, I think it's so great that you have such a structure set up in place now. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is impossible to teach it and in, in a classroom setting. I struggle with that in the class in that seminar that I was speaking of. It's a struggle yeah. for me. I'm still working on figuring that out. And universities don't really generally put their instruction into co-curricular activities like that, the instructional emphasis. Right. Because it's an incredible amount of time. I mean, an unbelievable amount yeah. of time. Uh, so it is, I think that's why it's unique and it's not everywhere. Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's quite a yeah it's quite a thing that you built there and and uh you know yeah. i mean your students um success along with your own success is is, is a credit to that um i'm so, I'm so i oh i, I i'm sorry sam i go ahead. I, it, no. I remain so thrilled truly it, over the last like 10 years that there's now this like army of music <laughs> directors that have come out of your program who like I've I've said I've said to so many people who like show up in New York or in Chicago or wherever they go after they leave Northwestern, just like knowing all this stuff, and um, that is in such that's such a testament to what you've built that prepares them and in sort of this sort of like uh, pick a little from column A, pick a little from column B of learning in the classroom and by working on a production, you sort of end up with this well-rounded like cavalcade of skills not a sentence but uh with with <laughs> but it's so amazing because you. as you have said earlier they show up and there are so many northwestern alums in theater now who are who like can't stop working in normal times and um that's that's because they show up they they show up with knowledge which is awesome i think it's Thank probably you. partially based on the fact that they had Previously, uh, music directors or aspiring music directors had one superpower, and they sort of rode that and learned the other stuff along the way. Whereas now they're showing up; they had their superpower still, but they still know everything else now. Uh, so that's a big deal. I think that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's about you know the first activity we do in seminar is like here are, I lay out all the areas of skill, and I have them all like kind of with right where they are in those areas, you know. And you know it's like very eye opening to some of them. You know, yeah. and it's a great, it's a great moment. I'm like, great. Well, you have your time remaining to help fill in these areas, you know, and I will help you help provide opportunity for that. Right. And let's also double down on what you're feeling like you're best at. Um, and that's where the fun of it is. Right. Uh, and, and it, you are able to be much more creative when you're much more versed in all of the different areas. Right. You might not consider yourself an orchestrator, but if you know that you understand how to orchestrate and you have done it, as a music director that might not be orchestrating, you have such a deeper understanding and insight into the orchestration, which is which is important to having a really wonderful creative product. And you can draw those, you know, those connections across all the disparate areas of music direction. Not to mention how to talk to the orchestrator and oh, how to yeah. how to set them up for success and how to like make that collaboration work if you can speak their language. Um, that that's really important. And the reality is if you're starting out like there, it all depends on what level you're working at, you know? So like, you know, I have an orchestrator at the Marriott for when I want one, right? I, but if you're starting out at the kind of like more like storefront theater level and you're doing, you're, you're doing all the things, <laughs> you have to be able to do all of the things. You know, I think of our, our great friend, Matt Deitchman as just like made a mark on the city of Chicago as just being able to do everything at the highest of level levels in all of these theaters he was working at before. not to mention the fact that he was like a really terrific actor and singer and that's right all that stuff i mean <laughs> and just wrote an amazing podcast about a fish that that's you true have to check out yellow oh, I... grouper pi it's gonna change your life okay I'll do yellow that. grouper pi <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah that's really cool that's really cool that that's that's a thing now and and uh you know if if i'm if I'm someone, you know, Sam, I want to get into a career in musical theater, where do I start? Do I call Ryan Nelson and say, hey, where do I start? Is that where I start? I, and, you want to, and you can answer this one. Well, 
I'll, I'll take a, I'll, t- I'll take a first <laughs> I'll take a first swing and then you clean up after me which is <laughs> which is I'll I'll sim- I'll say this I think um uh two things I think it's going to be very kind of different but more or less the same depending on where you live um I think uh the theater scene of New York and to its to an extent Chicago is very different than kind of everywhere else I would argue but no matter what I would say your first swing is to um, get a sense of the cast of characters in your town or city or area. And by that, I mean, if you play the clarinet, um, who are the clarinet players in town that work in theater? Um, And I would get a, I would sort of maybe start there and, and sort of um, flag those people down and start picking their brain about what was their journey to starting to play clarinet for theater in Boston or whatever it might be? Um, and uh, because sort of circling back to what I was talking about earlier about showing up in New York and not really knowing anybody yet, what you find out about theater is it's a really small community of people, no matter where you are. Um, and I, I often feel like um, if you're willing to make a an overture to people and sort of just get to know who's in the community a little bit and express your interest um generally that tends to uh evolve into whether it's a subbing opportunity or being recommended for something or whatever or whatever it may be and i think there's a lot of what is hard about this answer is like i said earlier there is no real hard or fast way to get a job in theater we don't um have auditions for theater orchestras in new york the way you audition for a symphony um it's 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 a little more of a of a uh of an abstract thing um but i will also say um that you that you want to like get to know the genre a little bit and then get to know sort of the whole uh, spectrum of what that entails, which is the rock musicals of Ryan Nelson's career, uh, <laughs> all, all, all the way back to the Rodgers and Hammerstein stuff, and just sort of like get a sense of how wide that is. I think if you don't, I think people who paint musicals with a bit of a wide brush assume that it's all tap dancing, smiling people um, with sequins. And uh, there's a lot that falls under that umbrella. So, what the reason I bring that up is you'll be really employable if you play the clarinet and you also play the flute and the saxophone and you can find your way around a blues and you can find your way around an R and B horn section. Uh, and you can sort of meld into all of those areas. I don't know if that's a good answer, which is why I went first. No, uh, no, it was good. I, I, yeah, it's pretty I, good I, you know, edu- first of all, like the, the greatest thing about greatest thing about music direction is that you are, you are a uh, dabbling, in all styles, right, of music, right? So the, the, the greatest thing that ever happened to me is that when I went to North Texas as a like conducting master's and doctoral student, like it was so musicologically heavy there, so many classes and so many periods of music that I, I, I use all that today, you know, in theater work, like the understanding of music of all time, right? That's, that's the really great part of our job, you know? Um, in terms of like backing up to like getting into the profession, I think like for those, people that are like at, are in school perhaps you know or uh, you know even uh, like maybe in high school about to go to college and like how do I go this direction you know you have to be good at your thing right so like you have to become a great musician however that you go about that and that still is foremost right it, that has got to be foremost because you are the music musical expert you are hired to be the person that knows the most about all things musical right what I find though for like music majors is like, it's not about, you know, we're, I, I, I think we can all agree that we were mostly trained to execute the notes on the page as well and as musically as possible. And that was the majority of our training right there, right? That is very much not what we do as music directors. We, I mean, we do that, <laughs> but we don't, we are constantly manipulating those notes on the page. We are constantly making decisions and changing those notes on the page. Nothing is, is immutable, right? Uh, and, and so that creative side of that, that's what, like, I find music majors that we open the door for like, wait, yeah, that's, you need to be great, but you also need to learn how to like be more creative in the thinking and, and, and actually offer original contribution to said music. Right. 
Uh, so getting the musicians in touch with that kind of the and getting musicians in touch with the theater side, how, how we talk, how we communicate with other designers, what the priorities are. And then I've got a lot of theater. A lot of the my students that have gone and been most successful in New York have been actually theater majors that have a good musical background and have engaged deeply in making their musician side better. But they but they came to school as theater majors, right? And but you've got to like fill out your other side, like and that's what I think you know Ian is is talking about. That's that's the secret sauce. Yeah, and I, I do like Ian's suggestion of. You know, if you are going to call up the local clarinet player or whatever, just a, a good place to start is just asking questions and like getting to know them rather than calling them and asking for work, because that's usually a no, no, I would say. Even if it's not a no, no, I think it it's I, I wouldn't frown upon it. I just find like so often the answer isn't going to be yes, right. only because like that person has their system and their way of doing things and if and the people who they're already going to call. I don't think there's anything personal there. It's just, you know, I've heard plenty of stories of like, you know, somebody drops off a letter at the Broadway theater being like, hey, do you need a sub ever? And the person says, what are you doing tomorrow? Like, I've heard that story. That probably happened once or twice. But the what's much more likely is that um, people sort of have their way of doing things and the people that they already recommend. So what's maybe better is to build a personal connection and to show, hey, I'm really inter I'm really interested in this and I want to get good at this and I want to know how you got your start and what advice do you have? And just pick somebody's brain. That's sort of so much more likely to pay dividends down the road into sort of start in by them starting to recommend you for things or to call you for things themselves. Yeah. Um, I also just want to add one other thing too, which um, I've said it a thousand times and Ryan's sick of me saying it, which is that, um, y yes, the, 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 like I've, the foremost skill is being good at the instrument and like having the musical chops, right. And being able to like turn out a halfway decent performance. But I often, I always say that that's 50% of the gig. And the other 50% is showing up on time and being the kind of person that people want to hire, um, which just isn't that complicated, but um, I think often gets overlooked. And the reason it's really important to say you must have not, it must have been a while since you worked with me then. No, no kidding. <laughs> um, but, the, but Sam, your story is such a testament to that because I always say you never know where your next gig is coming from. You thought you were never going to see Chris Yonke again. And then a month later, you get a phone call, right? Yeah, and, um, and the same is true with me. The, the uh, one of my biggest mentors in New York called me after not hearing from him in a year and a half. And then I worked for him for four years. And I think like you, you just never know when sort of the connections are going to be remade. And it's just so essential that you be a team player and you be friendly and you say hello and say good morning and ask how somebody's day is and just like be a person. Um, it's, I just like, I've said it so many times I should get it tattooed on my forehead, but it, <laughs> but it never becomes less true. But it's, yeah. it is true. And you embody this, Ian. So I, I love when you keep saying it. It's a hundred percent. It's the thing that, you know, it, it, there's no good word for it, right? Because it's partly networking, but it's partly just being a human. It's partly building relationships. But this is the aspect of, of getting work that also needs to be just talked about and, you know, learned and embraced as, as important as having the skill. A hundred percent. You want to work with people that you want to work with. Totally. So as it's enjoyable to work with. Them. Yeah, exactly. And so to, to your point, Sam, there is, I, I, I would always vote for like, Hey, can I buy you a coffee and ask about your path versus, Hey, can I sub for you? And then beyond that, there's sort of the second level of the second question after, can I buy you a coffee is so can I sub for you? <laughs> the, the, the second, the second question is just like be a human being and yeah. be friendly. And, um, and it, evolves from there well i think you know to, to both of your points i think that for me if i were to have a sub in my clarinet section and i have someone who plays at a nine out of ten but they're just a total jerk and then someone comes in and plays at a seven out of ten or an eight out of ten but they're incredibly pleasant to play at. 10 times out of 10 i'm picking the second person it's not and it's not even a comparison absolutely it's, it's because, not even close and i always say i always say a version of exactly that and the reason is that i have to sit with them in the dark for 3 hours and <laughs> play a musical and i'd so much rather do that with person b 
than with person A. It's just not a competition for me. Speaking of the specific in the dark, uh, what I have to say the most, one, the most thrilling night of my life was getting to watch Ian conduct Hamilton. Oh, this is with the original cast is at the beginning, sitting in the pit, watching Ian beautifully conduct and play. Even though you did miss that patch change, we had the chime patch change. But we'll Wait, you were there that night? <laughs> yeah. I tell that story constantly. I, I had didn't... to ask Lin Manuel for like for forgiveness. Oh my incredible. god, I didn't remember that you were there that night. Yeah. That is hysterical. <laughs> okay, what he's talking about? What he? Because I can't stand to listen to him compliment me anymore. What he's what he's what he's talking about is in the second act of Hamilton. There's this song, Hurricane. Um, and, uh, if you know the song, you know that there's these harp arpeggios that happen sort of in the clear, in the eye of the hurricane, there is, and there's, they're like, they're just like keyboard arpeggios and the harp has all this delay on it. So like every note sounds like five or six times and it, uh, and you play it, uh, on keyboard one as the conductor. Problem with that is that the patch before that is these like heavy cathedral chimes, oh, uh, and and uh, and obviously we we know the punchline already. But um, what you have to know is that the harp is in this very exposed, really really quiet thing. The cathedral chimes are going in this big full ensemble like drummy section, and then everything cuts out, and it's the piano and the harp and the vocal in this case, sung by the author, standing 12 feet from my face. And um, <laughs> of course, I missed the patch change. And he sings, in the eye of the hurricane, there's... <laughs> and the best part about it isn't that you were there. The best part isn't that Lynn was singing the role. The best part about it is that the rest of the creative team, that's the director, Tommy Kale, Andy Blankenbuehler, the choreographer, and my boss, Alex Lacamoire, were all watching at the soundboard together. <laughs> um, I still tell that story. And it sounded just like a gong was pushed down the stairs. <laughs> and I cannot believe you were there. It's that a category five well, hurricane, I, huh? Yeah, exactly. I'm following the score. You know, and, I, and, and then I hear the carnage. Like, and look, we've all we've both done this a million times in our lives, and we're going to do it a million times more. Oh, well, my you God. Know, the mispatch change is the thing. And, you know, and I'm like, don't show or don't react. Don't react. I'm like, <laughs> try not to react because it was so, you know, what, but, what, but, but what I love about that night, you know, it was just such an accomplishment. Obviously, this is probably, probably the most influential musical of all time, but also the way that you engage with the players, you know, that, that you're playing an incredibly hard piano book and conducting, which is a, a ton of really complex music, uh, but doing it with just like engagement and that positive conducting connection you know and the smile and the very thing that i like i always just always believed in from conducting whether it was a wind band piece or whatever right it is really just about connecting with the people in front of you and that was just like a full circle like awesome oh my I'm gosh blushing, but i'm just... i'm i'm dying inside but i learned it from being in your wind ensemble <laughs> truly if i learned it from being in symphonic band and playing under you and being like oh it can be really fun to be in band uh, because you can, you know, as the xylophone player, God forbid, you can feel important and you can yeah. feel seen and heard and da 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 da. Well, that's the great thing about Northwestern in general. I mean, it's exactly what you know Mallory Thompson does. I mean, it's the approach, which was very much, yep. you know, a, my postgraduate degree. I'll call it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank well, you for awesome. saying all that. I'm I'm dying inside, but it's incredibly kind of you. <laughs> yeah, who wants to compliment me now? Huh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't, don't do it. Please don't. Um, so uh, you guys are obviously both very accomplished and we've been going for a good clip here, but I, I do want to ask you one last thing, which is, you know, both of you guys have accomplished a tremendous amount throughout your career. Do you have any like bucket, bucket list things that you want to do like before your career is over? Like, is there a show that you want to conduct? Do you want to go somewhere and conduct a show? Do you want to play a certain hall? Like anything that you, that you really want to do? Uh, Ian, go ahead. I have uh, I have two bucket list shows. Uh, I I I would kill to do Rent someday. Uh, I you know I probably shouldn't do another three hour composed through musical, but alas, here we are, uh, dying to do it. And then the other is the show that brought us together, Sam, which is I I would kill to do Ragtime again. Oh, um, Ragtime's great. Yeah. Which is just this unbelievable score. Someday beyond yeah. that, I I would love to. Um, do something that uh, that I've developed from from the very very early days, probably as an arranger, music director, something that I've really had my hands in, um, and 
bring it all the way to Broadway. That would be a goal someday. Yeah, the problem with ragtime is it's it's amazing, but it's really big, really expensive, and nobody goes to it. <laughs> so that's the, those are the challenges with ragtime. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's sad, <laughs> but yeah. it's the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, I've got I've been lucky. I've I've got to do a lot of my favorite shows uh, between the Marriott and school, most of the Marriott. Um, and I got to conduct my favorite show, Sunday in the Park with George at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. That was like a, a, kind of a life-changing moment for me in general. But, you know, I've always wanted to do something else too. <laughs> this has been the ongoing issue with my life, you know? So like, uh, I, I don't want to ever give up the things I'm doing now. I love them, but uh, I've always wanted to have like some kind of organization and I've actually just like started one. So um my, my friend and collaborator, Aaron Thielen, and I, who's at the Marriott Theater, we started a nonprofit called Broadway Across Borders, which is some work we've been doing for the last three years, where we've had uh, some amazing opportun opportunities through the State Department to go into a country. We started with Bosnia and Herzegovina and work with artists there. And it's not like the typical, like, we're going to teach you music theater. It's about really getting them to, like, believe in themselves as artists. Uh, which is something that I think that we forget that, you know, while we have accomplished a lot, we've been through great schools, not everyone believes in themselves that they can actually do something or create something. Uh, and then they, taking these artists and these uh, other countries and we've taken them to a new country to work with other artists, hence the across borders part. So we're like, we're now we're an official nonprofit and we, we've been doing, we did a project with five countries uh, in the, this, this summer virtually. And we're working on another project with five countries virtually uh, right now, but once travel resumes, we'll be like, you know, executing these things in person. But that's been like kind of a bucket list. I didn't know that it was going to be a nonprofit. I didn't know that it was going to be this, but I knew that I wanted to be at the helm of creating an organization of some sort that has been eating at me for decades. And COVID gave me the light bulb. Like it all just kind of like got sparked. So that that's that's been really cool. I'm dying to do a show with you two again, for sure. Oh my God. Uh, and get the better. band back together. Uh, <laughs> we'll way too fun. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, and, and I like Ian, like I, I, the real joy of the work and challenge is the new work, new work, yeah. uh, creating something yeah. from nothing and taking it as far as it will go. Um, and, and I'm, I'm excited to have something like that uh, happen again, or get to work on something like that again. Well, terrific. Uh, Thank you guys so much for joining me. This has been super fun just to see you guys and hang out, talk a little bit, live live the live the fun times over again. You know what I mean? Oh my gosh! Thanks for um, asking. This is absolutely. this was the greatest. This was way too fun. Yeah, I, I especially liked the part where I got to correct the year that Wambu began. <laughs> that's I know perfect. that's. I, I I I felt that coming before I even got it out of my mouth. Yeah. I know you did. <laughs> but uh yeah and 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 for anyone who's interested in studying musical theater at northwestern you can i'm sure ryan would be happy to answer any emails uh ian you can follow him at instagram on on instagram which is like my favorite instagram name ever i have to clarify only because that it's 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 instagram i am like sam i am because oh. ian instagram was taken and i don't like to talk about it oh no all right well uh, you can check out Ian. Uh, obviously, you. <laughs> if you if you really want to see him, you can just buy a ticket to Hamilton on Broadway. He'll probably be conducting and you know uh, doing other great things. So uh, thank you guys. It's it's terrific to see you again and 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 have you guys as friends. I look forward to the day that we get to work together again. You'll you'll have to probably pry me into one of those theater pits one of these days. And we'll do it. We'll <laughs> okay, do it. And sounds Sam, good. I, I do want to compliment you that I, this podcast, another kind of birth of COVID. I yeah. just think is amazing. And it, everyone needs to make sure everybody listens to this because the conversations that you have are really applicable to all. If you don't play clarinet, you, you still care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It all kind of still really matters. I've been loving this podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for this. Um, and to Ryan's point, if you haven't had a chance already, be sure to stop by our website at candyclarinetispodcast.com where you can find more information about myself, the podcast, and links to all of our content platforms. Once again, I am Sam Rothstein, and thanks for tuning in to the Candid Clarinetist podcast.